podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Wednesday, March 23rd, 2011. Tech News Today is brought to you by GoToAssist Express. If you're in tech support, solve problems fast with the leader in remote support software, GoToAssist Express. For a free 30-day trial, visit gotoassist.com slash TNT. And by FreshBooks. FreshBooks is the easy online invoicing service that gets you paid quickly and makes you look professional. Get started with a free package at FreshBooks.com. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Sarah Lane. I'm Jason Howell. And joining us today from New York City, Mr. In Don Reisinger, freelance editor. You find him quite often on CNET. Uh, what, what's the name of your blog that you do? It's, is it still Digital Home? Yeah, still the digital home. Yep. Okay, I didn't know if you spruced it up, got a new title or or something. But check oh, out no. uh, Digital Home. We we actually link to your stories quite often uh, from the fact, TNT oh, show notes. In fact, one of the stories uh, the, that I read this morning was written by Don. Good see that? Mm -hmm. It's a very meta experience. And for on the a show. Yankees <laughs> fan, we actually kind of like him. For a Yankees oh, fan, you know, he's okay. He's okay. You know, I'll, I'll put it down right here. They're going to win the World Series this year. Yep. You heard it here first. Wow. Oh Going out on a limb there, Don. You're first, wearing, huh? you're wearing red and everything. <laughs> That's right. right. I, I, I will hope for a Yankees Cardinals World Series just so we can put a bet on it. Okay. All right, let's uh, start off with Firefox 4 numbers, uh, clearing 4.7 million downloads in the first 24 hours, according to Mozilla Glow, a site that logs these things. Uh, that is just over half what Firefox 3 got. Firefox 3 had 8 million. But remember, there was the download day that everybody was supposed to jump in and uh, mm -hmm. all download on the, on the same day to spike the numbers. Uh, it, it also, 4.7 million still way overdid IE9. They IE9 only got 2.35 million downloads in the first 24 hours. A lot of folks pointing out that IE9 doesn't work on Windows XP, Which whereas Firefox good, 4 does. I mean, what do we have? Still like 50% of Windows users are actually running XP, so they didn't even have a choice. Yeah, they, so if you're looking for a brand new browser, you're not going to download IE9 if you're on Windows XP. And Firefox is well aware of that. Um, Firefox Engineering Director Jonathan Nightingale said, hey, 40 to 50% of the web is still on XP. That's too big a number for us to just leave them behind. Firefox is like, it's our duty. Yeah. We have to include all these people. Uh, what's amazing about it is it would be Microsoft that you would think wouldn't leave these people behind, but they are. So it's like, you know, guys, you might want to think about all those. Yeah, It's more the same for Microsoft, actually, when you think about it. I mean, it's just, hey, you know, get away from XP, get away from XP. But in the, at the end of the day, a lot of enterprise customers and a lot of consumers are still there, and they're not willing to switch, especially in the enterprise. So I think it's a mistake by Microsoft. Uh, yeah, I, I think Microsoft's saying, look, we, we want to have IE9 work as well as possible, so we're only going to support our newer operating systems because that also serves us in that it might nudge people into upgrading their operating system, whereas Firefox doesn't have that. Mozilla doesn't have that consideration. They're just going to put it out for as many platforms as possible. Google Chrome doesn't have that consideration. They also are available for Windows XP as well as OS X, which IE9 is also not available for OS X. So as far as, you know, hitting... Uh, market share when Microsoft is limiting themselves by not making it available for XP. Absolutely. Are. And and this is probably the last time we're going to have this conversation because Firefox uh, is, is going to move to the same model that Google Chrome uses where they just continually update your browser and there's not a big numbered release. Right, which I think is better for everybody in the long run because you're not I, I, big releases are fun and exciting because the browser looks really different and there's all the stuff that's been added, but they're also holding features back so they can give it to you in a big, exciting bundle, you know, like Christmas. I also think Chrome probably has a lot to do with the fact that the Firefox 4 numbers just aren't as strong as the Firefox 3 numbers because a lot of people use Chrome now. Yeah, and, and it doesn't mean you can't try out beta stuff. In fact, Chrome 11, the next version of Chrome, is available in a beta. You've been playing it around. Playing yeah, around it. in fact, um, one of the cool features is the speech recognition capabilities. It's like built into to uh, HTML5, and we were trying to stump it last night, and you know, it's, it, depending on what kind of program you use, speech recognition can be really bad. This was working really well. Granted, I, you know, only played around with it for five or ten minutes, but I'm And you excited. only need it to do simple things. Yeah, it's, you're not, I mean, you're not going to be yelling in an accent in a moving car with the windows down kind of thing. <laughs> well, it's, you aren't. Well, 
Most people are um, think. immigrant yeah, you know taxi what? cab driver I, Chrome I, users I, might. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, the the implications are really cool. So let's move on to uh, some app store woes. The the problems of a curated app store are showing themselves today in two different stories. Uh, first of all, in a letter to Apple's Scott Forstall, uh, the Apple senior vice president, Senators Harry Reid, Charles Schumer, Frank Lautenberg, and Tom Udall asked that any app that helps to identify where local police officers have set up DUI checkpoints be removed from the App Store. And in fact, they sent this letter to RIM as well. RIM has already said, yes, we are going to do that. We will remove any app that identifies drunk driving checkpoints uh, from the App Store. But is that is that really Apple's job to to police this sort of stuff? These apps aren't illegal. No, and I think that there's a few problems with this. And Don, you know, let us know if you agree. It's like, first of all, if there's a DOI checkpoint, let's say that I'm driving from point A to point B and I notice one and it's on a busy section and it's traf uh, rush hour, I might tweet out to however many people are paying attention to, you know, their tweet stream at the time, checkpoint at 9th and Brandon, avoid. It's awful. Well, how's that really different than using an app to find out the same thing if for some reason you were concerned about traffic? Also, um, I don't know. I mean, I, it's just, it's like, it, it's, it's, people have a variety of reasons that checkpoints might be, it's not. It's the, like, the, there was a, there was a, a quote where someone said, the only reason that you'd ever use this app is that yes. if you're driving while drunk. Exactly. The senators, their argument is, only people who are trying to drive drunk would ever need this app. Therefore, is an awful thing to to provide folks for. Mm -hmm. uh, only pirators it, use BitTorrent. Only exactly. Yeah. I, you know, you I, know I, I'm in one of those camps where I, I believe that Apple and every other you know so-called retailer, if you want to call it that, because I mean it runs this store, um, has the right to put whatever apps it wants in there and to take whatever apps it wants out. Um, it's the same sort of thing if I go to Walmart, if I go to, you know, whatever store, they decide what's in there and I don't as a customer. Um, at the same time, I hear what you guys are saying and I do think that, you know, look, we can't just pigeonhole this and say only these people are going to use it. But, um, you know, there's, there's another societal impact here, I guess, in my mind at least. And that is, you know, if it's true that only those people or a lot of those people that are dr uh, drinking and driving are using this app, well, to be honest with you, if I'm not drinking and driving and I'm out on the roads, I don't want those people to have this app. I don't want them to go around that checkpoint because mm -hmm. they could hurt myself or my family. So, you know, I'm torn between this. I could see both sides of the argument. And at the end of the day, if it doesn't really matter all that much to, you know, if it only matters to the developers and some of the people that are outraged by this and it helps save lives, I'm okay with it. Should the government be able to tell Apple what app should be in the App Store or not, though? Well, look, I mean, the government is involved in everything anyway. I mean, you know, it, that goes back to the same old question, if the government should allow, you know, this AT&T and T-Mobile, should that should be involved in that acquisition? I mean, the government is involved whether we like it or not. It's the, it's the way things go in this country and elsewhere around the world. And so I think we have to either try to stop it, which, you know, is, is going to be <laughs> extremely difficult, or we say, okay, there are areas where there's, there's a good reason for the government to be involved and there are areas where there's a, a bad reason for it to be involved. In this case, look... I think there are other more egregious a areas where it's getting involved. This one I don't think is really that big of a deal. There's another App Store controversy brewing as well. Uh, a lot of folks have been complaining that Apple allowed an app from Exodus International, called Exodus International, uh, to be in the App Store. It is an app that uh, uh, proposes that it will help you resist homosexual urges. Now, without getting into the, the whole controversy of, right. of curing homosexuals, uh, the application did disappear from the App Store on Thursday. Apple bowed uh, to the pressure from people complaining, saying, we are offended by this app, uh, and they said... The app, the, we removed the Exodus International app from the App Store because it violates our developer guidelines by being offensive to large groups of people. Uh, once again, should is it right for Apple to be curating this way where they, they, they bow to pressure the first instance from the government, the second instance uh, from, from a group of people uh, saying we're offended by this? Do we, whether we agree with the content of these apps or not, do we actually risk narrowing down the usefulness of the app store because all viewpoints aren't represented remember free speech is for speech you don't like it's easy 
to to say free speech is for speech I like because nobody's going to complain. Yeah, the, when I initially read the story, I sort of went, huh, okay, well, let me think of another example. And I thought of, you know, the baby shaking app that was also pulled. That's different because that was, you know, it could be taken as advocating violence or, you know, harming folks. This is more of an issue of enough people say I'm offended and Apple says, okay, you're offended. And it seems to be bowing towards uh, one way of thinking than the other. Well, large groups of people are offended by all sorts of things. And that could take down a lot of um, a lot of apps. I mean, what if there's an article in the Daily written in a certain way and it offends a large group of people? Is that edition of the Daily going to be pulled? Probably not. But I mean, it's all suppos supposedly following the same rules, right? Yeah, it's, it's the difficulty of being a curator versus just kind of a marketplace operator. It's, you know, and, and, and Don, you brought up the, 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 I think, very valid point. It's Apple's store. They can put whatever they want in mm -hmm. it. Uh, but Apple is also trying to play it more like a mall operator, saying the developers make their apps and they come in and they sell them. We're just the marketplace. The mall gets to decide what stores go in, but do they go into the stores and say, you know, I mean, forget whether things are legal or Ill illegal. If they're selling legal things, do they say, well, you can't sell that anymore? Maybe they do. I don't know. Well, I think this is the issue with Apple right now, and I think it's the issue it's facing, and that is, like you said, if it wants to be that mall operator, then it has to just say, look, that's who we are. Whether everyone in the world likes it or not, that's who we are. But Apple's walking that fine line. It's saying, well, yeah, you know, we're a mall operator with these kinds of apps, but for these other things, we're not. And at the end of the day, Apple... I think is is most concerned about how it's viewed by people. I mean, it, when we look at Apple, its brand is perhaps the most important aspect next to Steve Jobs of its of it, of the company. I mean, without that brand, it wouldn't be Apple. And so, I think it's extremely sensitive to that, and this is probably just another example of that where Apple is wondering, okay, should I be the mall operator here or should I be the person that says this is what's allowed and this is what's not? And I think if it impacts the brand negatively in in the, in its mind, it just it makes it goes with that we remove it kind of thing. Yeah, they don't allow porn. They, yeah, I they're mean they're not into porn. Google they're operates not into the hate speech. They, Google operates the Android marketplace much differently. So you have a choice. If you don't like the way Apple curates its store, you can not get an iPhone, not use the App Store, and right. and go get an Android phone, uh, and go that way. I mean, I, there there is that side of the argument as well. The, I keep wanting to call him Father Bertrand after I saw this Wired headline. Uh, the father of Mac OS X, Bertrand Serlet, is leaving Apple. Uh, he Not for the priesthood. <laughs> not for the priesthood, no. He is actually leaving to do science, apparently. Yeah, he's he's got a computer science degree. He's been working with Apple for a long time. He's, he's, he's the one that's credited for... The OS X software that many of us use every day. And uh, it really, you know, for anybody who's like, ooh, is it because Lion is going in a new direction and his, you know, his son is setting? It doesn't really sound that way at all. It sounds like he's worked uh, as a faithful employee for Apple uh, for a long time. Steve Jobs brought him in from Next. Yeah, they, um, that's where he started working with Steve Jobs was at Next, building yeah. the operating system there. And when Apple acquired Next... He became the, the that's how he became exactly. the father of OS X. He started working on that operating system for Apple right then. Yeah, so he and Steve, I mean, their relationship goes back to before they were working at Apple, uh, you know, when they started working together. And yeah, it doesn't seem to have anything to do with, ooh, OS X moving towards the way of iOS because he's responsible for that too. You know, when I look at this, I mean, a lot of times... We talk about Apple, everyone says, well, it's Steve Jobs. He's a micromanager and he decides what happens and that's that. But I think this is a pretty big loss for Apple. I mean, you know, the fact that if Jobs really is what people say, and then he's a micromanager, he can be difficult to work with. The fact that someone has stuck it out with him for, you know, 22 years and then some and has been his loyal companion all these years when it comes to developing software, I think it's a major issue because now we need to bring someone else in to, that needs to learn how to work with jobs on that level and do, you know, to not only suggest good ideas about the software, but also, you know, give in when they need to. And, and this is what he's been doing all these years. Now he's leaving. Now jobs needs to work with somebody else. And, and there's a whole lot of factors here. So I think this is a major, major loss. Although it does sound like they've been grooming Craig Federighi, who's uh, Sirlet's uh, successor for a while now. I mean, it sounds like Sirlet has been uh, selling off uh, some of his Apple shares as of late. 
Uh, so he's probably been thinking about this already. Last year when they um, when Apple demoed Lion, um, Federighi was running the demo. So I mean, the two of the the gentlemen have obviously been going over their notes together. And yeah, it seems like the, the, the transition seems to have been coming for a long time. But, yeah. in, in, but in Apple fashion, there was nothing leaked about it, uh, unlike an iPhone being left in a bar. Nope. All right, let's take a, a quick break before we uh, talk about what the New York Times is doing to a Twitter account uh, and debate <laughs> that. Uh, if Now, this wouldn't happen because Don's a smart guy, but let's say Don ran into a problem with his computer and only I could fix it for him. Uh, I would have to fly all the way to New York City to help him fix it or do that game of telephone like, okay, what do you see now? Okay, do you see that me edit, that menu? Do you see the file menu? Do you see the file? No, not that <laughs> file Don't menu. Don't double click it. No, Just the other file once. menu. Oh, well, now, how did you get there? That is crap. You don't want to do that. If no. you're in tech support, try Go to Assist Express. Brought to you by our friends at Citrix. Go to Assist was recently named the worldwide market leader in remote support. The way it works is you start your session with just one click. It's like all the services from Citrix. You send the person you're helping an instant email invitation. They don't have to have anything installed already on their side. Uh, it works on both PCs and Macs. You share your screen. They can share theirs. You see what they see. You find out the problem. You solve it. You do an integrated live chat so you can explain what's going on, ask some questions, and you are done without having to travel or go through any kinds of communication charades to figure out what's going on. You'll solve more tech support questions more quickly and uh, help clients even when they're away from their computer. Don can just go to the Yankees game and say, yeah, just oh. fix my computer. I'm out of here. Uh, Sounds good to me. Yeah, so go to Assist. Try it out for free. Uh, go to Assist is brought to you by Citrix, and all data exchange during your session is completely secure. So give it a shot. Try to go to Assist Express free for 30 days at gotoassist.com slash TNT. Use that URL to let them know you heard about it right here on Tech News Today. All right, New York Times. Obviously, we've been talking about the paywall. Mm -hmm. We've been talking about the ways around the paywall. And apparently now uh, they are going after the Twitter account Free NYT. Uh, and, and Free NYT has been feeding all of the links from New York Times' all own Twitter accounts into one Twitter account, making it easy for you to click on New York Times articles without hitting the paywall. That's right, yeah, because you get a certain amount of free access uh, to articles per month. What is it, 20 articles? And then you're supposed to be, you're supposed to pay. But there are ways around it. Like if a New York Times article tweets out, here's this new article I just wrote, you can click on that link and still read the article. So Free NYT is just basically retweeting what the New York Times employees are already tweeting. But the New York Times doesn't like that. Yeah, they have asked Twitter to disable the feed as it is in violation of the New York Times trademark. And that's because it's called Free NYT. So yeah. if you called it Free, that paper formerly known as Ha yeah. Ha, well, it would be fine. Cory Doctorow has already set up a mirror site called Free Unnamed News. Perfect. If you would like to, uh, if you'd like to follow that instead. I mean, I would, I would, I assume that New York Times is just sort of miffed that somebody is taking all of its content and 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 making it easy for folks to get around a paywall. But if they really mean that it's because they're bothered by NYT in the Twitter handle. It's the only I'd way like, they can... I'd like to see what they do about the unnamed news site. I mean, if you just make a same account and don't mention NYT, are they going to take that down too? They probably will. They don't have a leg to stand on. I, I know. I, I think it was the convenient use because, I mean, if you look at, um, you know, the, like, what was it? The fake CEO Steve Jobs Twitter account they had to change to not fake CEO Steve. I mean, this is... I think that was the, the quickest and easiest way to sort of mitigate some of the, the criticism it thought and to get what it wanted. But I guess, um, you know, it's all backfiring. And I think they should have had a little bit more foresight to say, you know what, this probably wouldn't be a good idea if we do this because these sort of things are going to happen, like the mirror site. Yeah, I mean, you could make the argument, you could make the trademark argument that free NYT could be interpreted to sound like it's an official New York Times feed totally. if you knew nothing else about it it and, would confuse somebody so sure. so possibly they that's all they're going after although i doubt it they did tell pc mag as we have said previously as with any paid product we expect that there will be some percentage of people who will find ways around our digital subscriptions we will continue to monitor the situation but plan no changes to the programming or paywall structure in advance of our global launch that's a big wink wink to me it's like look you're smart enough to get around the paywall Good on you. We're right. not going to worry about you till after March 28th. We're busy.
I, I don't know. I, I just, I, I can't help but think that they're being a little naive with how much people can find ways to get around paywalls and that it won't be as hard as they assume it'll be for folks. I mean, I think that they're, well, they're banking on you and me saying too much work, just too much work to try to find some link yeah. that gets me to the article I want to read. I'll just pay and make it easier. It's not that hard. Well, I mean, I think there's another aspect of this here too, that I, I'm not sure how uh, computer savvy some of the New York, New York Times readers are. They might be extremely computer savvy. They might not. I, don't, I have no idea. But I'm mm -hmm. just saying maybe they think that um, the average New York Times reader won't g jump through all these hoops to, to do that, to get behind it. I mean, maybe there's some speculation there on their part. Um, maybe they'll be right. Maybe they'll be wrong. But I think maybe there's an element of that here. Hey, I'll tell you what, I am less likely to go to the Wall Street Journal. I am less likely to go to the New York Times because I know there's a paywall, not because I don't believe in paying for content, but because the way the paywalls work, it's confusing and harassing. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, sometimes I click on a link and it works. Sometimes I only get part of the story and I hit the paywall. Sometimes this and that. You know what? It's just easier for me to find the story elsewhere. And it will be elsewhere. And that's the thing is almost every story is. So... I, it's you got if you're going to do the paywall game i think there is a way to do it and i don't want to get into it right now but i don't think the way to do it is ends up confusing people and makes them you know try to game the system by going around twitter i think i think you have to come up with different ways of monetizing it yeah. speaking of different ways of monetizing uh don you had an article up on digital home today uh ea's free-to-play executive uh ben cousins says 60 bucks you should never pay 60 bucks for games what's this about Right. So yeah, Ben Cousins, um, like I said, runs easy, it runs easy studios for EA. And he says, look, we should be moving towards, uh, the ability to try games out and play games and then pay for extra content, like, you know, level ups or, you know, in-game virtual goods, whatever, uh, to monetize the title that paying $60 to find out if a game is good or bad is just plain wrong. And, uh, you know, it's an interesting topic, and it's something that a lot of companies, EA especially, I mean, it makes sense, e Easy Studios and all, but EA, um, is, is really concerned about, they're really thinking about. I mean, last, last year, or the past 12 months, I should say, they made about $220 million on their uh, digital content, like DLC and free-to-play stuff. So it's a growing business, not even close to a significant portion of its business, but... Um, it could very well be where the market is heading. And elsewhere overseas, especially in Asia, there's a lot of this going on. So I thought it was an interesting topic. I thought it was, inter you know, I thought it was uh, somewhat surprising that a, that a guy from EA, who is, you know, employed by EA, even though he's, you know, he's from Easy Studios, but he is an EA employee, would say this when he knows that EA makes most of its cash on that $60 per game fee. Yeah, he, he told Rock, Paper, Shotgun... Uh that's a really harsh business model if you think about it objectively, but it is the business model that's that's keeping his company afloat. But again, it's sort of the same thing we were just talking about with the paywall. He's pointing out, look, you can't do that forever. That's 60 bucks to, to just get access. That's not the way to go. We need to develop more of what I'm doing, which, you know, he's doing it. So, of course, he thinks it's better. Uh, but I, I think he is pointing the way towards the future. Although I don't think we ever get to a situation where every game is free to play and then you pay to continue. There's there's always going to be a game you just want to buy and play. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, no matter what anybody's really saying, it it's in EA's best interest to provide a variety of games. You know, there's some expensive games. There's some more kind of mobile, downloadable, free-to-play games. And if they offer... Um, a variety of, of styles, then they're just going to keep making money. I mean, EA made, what, $2 billion in revenue uh, last year. So this is, you know, their, their sort of microtransition area. The, the Easy Studios portion of it is, like Don said, it's only, you know, in the low millions, but it's still a significant portion, and that number will continue and to it'll grow. grow. Yeah, definitely. And when you hear EA's uh, CEO talk about it, he says, look, this is going to be bigger and bigger and bigger, and we're focusing our efforts there. And I think we're going to see a lot of that, not only from EA, but from Activision Blizzard and a lot of other major uh, publishers in that space. Uh, we are going to see the earthquake in Japan affect the winners and losers in smartphones and tablets, too, according to the Digitimes article I read today. Silicon uh, wafer supplies are becoming tight. Major chip suppliers intend to give priority 
to long-term contract holders from first-tier brands. That means people like HP, people like Nokia, people like Apple. Uh, production is likely to be impacted by tight supply of components and materials used to produce memory chips, and there's concern that interruptions in the supply of blank wafers, photoresists, polishing slurries, target materials, nitrogen gas could disrupt the manufacturing in the broad marketplace because major suppliers of these parts and items locate their production lines within the north of Japan. And so it's not that there won't be enough to build some devices, mm -hmm. but there will only be enough to build, build some devices, not all devices that are wanted. So if you're not a major player, you may get wiped out because you just can't make the product you want to sell. That that's a sobering thought. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's some scary stuff. No, it really is because I mean, um, I like you said, Apple probably won't be affected all that greatly by this. But uh, you know, what about those small companies that are trying and, and they're they're trying to do what they need to do to compete? I mean, it's bad enough if you're competing in the tablet market against Apple. Bad enough if you're competing in, in the smartphone market against Apple, and now you can't get the supplies you need to do so. Um, this is a scary thing for these companies. And, uh, you know, it's not just that. I mean, you look at elsewhere around the market. You have the, you know, LCDs for uh, I mean, the panels for televisions. You have, I mean, it's everywhere and it's everything. And I think over the next several months, right now, a lot of these companies are saying, oh, don't worry about it. We'll be okay. We'll be okay. But I think over the next several months is the rebuilding efforts start up and we really are able to gauge how bad the damage has been. Um, we could be seeing a lot more stories like this. You know, yep. it's, it's worth mentioning too that Apple. I mean, Apple bought up a lot of uh, a lot of supply components before there was an earthquake. Yeah. So this has just really compounded a problem that the little guys were already going to be facing this year. And Apple is also considering accepting price hikes, according to DigiTimes, uh, to make sure they secure their supply of touch panels. Uh, which are being shorted. So Apple's got cash. They've got money to come in and just buy whatever they need. Uh, Brooke Carruthers over at CNET.com has a, a great article compiling a couple of different uh, analyst reports from Display Search and IHS iSupply. If you really want to find out what these supplies that we were mentioning are, where they're coming from, and why there's going to be a shortage in these different areas and, and, and what that may impact. Even companies like Adobe are warning uh, that they're, they're – they may not make as much money in the next quarter because of business uncertainty in Japan. They're just not going to be able to sell as much software uh, because manufacturers have, have got other priorities right now. Ars Technica has a good report today uh, from the London School of Economics, Bart Kamertz and Bing Chung Meng, uh, who found essentially file sharing isn't the cause of the woes of the music industry. And in fact, fighting file sharing may make the market for music worse. Uh, the, the report says copyright enforcement won't bring back computer spending on, or consumer spending on music uh, because that market is declining anyway for other reasons. Uh, people are just spending more on other kinds of entertainment. Mm -hmm. And with the recession, people are spending less altogether. They point to a 2004 U.S. Consumer Expenditure Survey. This is 2004, mind you, back you know when, when the economy was doing much better. Showed that even spending on CDs by people who had no computer and therefore were unlikely to download and use BitTorrent dropped by over 40% from 1999 through 2004. So folks, folks who weren't in a position to do a lot of pirating still were saying, you know what? I'm just not going to buy a CD. I'm going to do something else with my money. Yeah, but I mean, 1999 to 2004 is like the height of file sharing and burning CDs. So exactly. if I don't have a computer, you know, I'm st I was straight out of college in 99. And if I don't have a computer at home, then I'll just have somebody burn me some one of his mixed MP3 CDs. And then True. I don't have to buy anything. But, I mean, the but is, that, of this is that a CD you would have bought? If you couldn't have had it burned, or you just having it burned because you can't student. afford, yeah, you wouldn't have afforded it anyway. That's the point of this study, is that it, you know the people who are. That's the, another point they make is the people who are pirating are not people who would have spent a lot of money on CDs if they didn't have piracy as an option. Yeah, but that doesn't mean that they weren't getting a lot of music for free by pirating. Right. It just it means that it wasn't the cause of the decline of the sales. Right. Uh, in 2009, for the first time, earnings from live music events <laughs> outstripped music sales in the United Kingdom. Uh, the music industry was worth £1.36 million. The live music scene was estimated around £1.54 
million pounds. Ticket sales rose by 5.8%. Secondary ticketing revenues shot up 15%. And receipts for related services at concerts, that's stuff like t-shirts, uh, came to 1.54 million pounds itself. So what they're saying is, look, you're making your money off touring, which a lot of people have said, but these these guys have done an economic analysis mm -hmm. and said, no, really, we can show you're making your money off touring now more than you're making it off of selling individual products. And they point out that folks with cell phones are going to start sharing files over the Internet more and more. And, and we've mentioned on this show, cell phones are starting to penetrate into places where they don't even have electricity. Mm -hmm. So you've got a marketplace that those people are not going to buy CDs, but you can reach them by allowing file sharing, by using file sharing, and possibly get them to show it up at a concert or two. Yeah, so so it's almost like the the idea, you know, if somebody wants to make money, it's get these, get some files out there, let us um, hear about a, a band, listen to a few of the songs, go, awesome, they're coming to town, I am going to buy a ticket and go see them in concert. Yeah. I mean, that's the new right. revenue model. You know, the, the music space itself is... I think it's rapidly changing right now. And, and um, you know, Nielsen came out last year, or uh, earlier this year, I mean, and said about last year, digital music sales were up about 1%. The overall music industry was down a little bit. Um, but at the same time, we're seeing recent studies, I actually wrote about it on the digital home, about streaming services on mobile phones exploding, about 95% annual growth um, over the next five years. So... The music industry is changing, and I think it's time that every company, whether it's Apple, the music labels, or, um, you know, just us, all the stakeholders, I should say, um, are, are acknowledging that, realizing that, and finding ways to, to modify our habits. And I think that's changing. There, there are a lot of things going on here, and I think the CD sales are just going to be one of many victims over the next few years um, of that change. The study even suggested that a small levy uh, could be uh, put on blank media. They have that for some blank media in some countries like Canada. Uh, it could be put on consumer recording equipment. Uh, you could, your ISP could include a small license to download and debate should refocus on alternative means of redistribution of the proceeds rather than on actually trying to stop people from downloading. Uh, none of these ideas are new in here, but these are guys who've sit, sat down and studied the data. And if you read the report, they can back up with why what we're saying is true rather than, you know, like you and I saying like, hey, it makes sense to me. Make some money off the concert. Sell some T-shirts. Make your stuff that way. They're like, no, actually, we can show the reason why that works. Yeah, here's where you need to start investing your money so you can get more money back. I mean, people can make a lot of money out of streaming. I, I consume most of my music via streaming a variety of ways. That's just the way it is. And I have no pro I have no problem with record stores or buying anything. It just makes more sense to me to stream a bunch of albums for a certain amount of money rather than download a bunch. It's like I have too many choices. I would prefer to stream. I, I really I, I'm not need, crazy about physical media anymore. I need to move to streaming more. I mean, I still uh, pay minstrels as a patron to come and play for me privately in my chambers. And it's a, that's just an old-fashioned way of doing music. Um, well, but they're touring, so in a way... Um, you're a forward thinker. They get my name out. Yeah. Yeah. They do pass around my card. <laughs> present it when, you know. I've heard other, you have a nice venue. Other actually. It's, yeah. it's dank. And, <laughs> it's a little dank. And, and low. <laughs> uh, that's how I feel the perspective of UK internet service providers is when they talk about blocking a hundred file sharing and cyber locker websites. Uh, just, just as a side note. All, on, on the other side of the coin though, shutting, it, shutting down LimeWire appears to have had an effect on piracy. It's peer-to-peer -peer file sharing in the U.S. dropped from 12% of web users to 9% between Q3 and Q4, uh, at least according to MPD. These are self-reported numbers, so maybe people are just less likely to admit it, but that was the time when LimeWire got shot down, so who knows. All right, let's move on to the news fuse. <laughs> Facebook this week said that it removes about 20 thousand profiles from the site per day for various infractions including spam inappropriate content and underage use facebook chief piracy advisor moselle thompson privacy not piracy i've been talking piracy so long facebook chief privacy advisor moselle thompson appeared before the australian parliament's cyber safety committee on monday to discuss internet related security issues and quoted the number leading to headlines about mass child bannings but it's the total number they ban per day only a part of that twenty thousand are kids 
Uh, what, what age do you have to be to sign up for a Facebook account? 13? I think so, yeah. So it's like a lot of 12-year-olds are like, come on, you want to sign up for a Facebook account? Yeah, and then they can. They, mom's out they of town. have clever ways of figuring out if you're underage. They've got and a fake ID. They ban you, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I can use Facebook. Look, yeah, right. 13. My, face, my fake Facebook connect. <laughs> Facebook. Do you guys um, want to hear my imitation of what happened between Oracle and Intel and HP today? All right, yeah. <clears throat> All definitely. right, so Oracle's like, HP is the only other place using Intel's Itanium processors, and we hate them, so we're going to stop because they're going to be so mad, and Itanium is so over anyway. Sounds and like And then Oracle. Right, and then Intel's like, Hey, who you calling over? We just announced a next generation eight core based titanium chip. Screw you, Oracle. <laughs> and then HP's new board members just argued with themselves in a corner. Yeah. Far away from That's the That's kind action. of the way it went down. So, titanium, not That was dead, my dramatic interpretation. No matter what Oracle says. Uh, would you like to have 100 megabit per second symmetrical data in your home? I would love that. How about gigabit per second symmetrical data in now your home? Now you're just talking crazy. Uh, no, you could go to Wilson, North Carolina for the first or Chattanooga, Tennessee for the second. Uh, those cities are among the 133 U.S. municipalities who have tired of excuses and price hikes and rolled out their own city-owned broadband at better speeds and better prices. A comprehensive new map developed by the Institute for Local Self-Reliance at muninetworks.org shows off 54 citywide fiber networks and 70 citywide cable nets. Sadly, many states actually prohibit cities from setting up their own networks, so you don't see it all over the United States, mostly in the east. Go Wilson, North mm. North Carolina. Yeah, I was going to say NorCal, sued. They're but They're getting that's sued by Time Northern Warner, California. by the way. <laughs> like, how, that's uncompetitive for you to be competitive with us. Yeah. <laughs> Got a nice Surprise. Yeah. Some Indian consumers are a little miffed that Apple hasn't rolled out iPads to them as quickly as in other parts of the world because India is not on the list to get the iPad 2 with many other countries this Friday. TG Daily reports that some citizens are so upset that they refuse to buy even the first gen iPad in protest. And Apple took a while to roll out the first iPad to India because Apple's like, you know, sale volumes just aren't Nobody very high it. there. We don't have I, a problem with you, India. You just don't buy a lot of iPads. Mm -hmm. India says, not good enough. We're protesting. The FCC has cleared an LG 920 smartphone, also known as the LG Optimus 3D, for use on the AWS 3G bands, also known as the weird flavor of 3G that T-Mobile uses. That means AT&T, Sprint, and now possibly T-Mobile all have a 3D smartphone in the works. You're up next, Verizon. While we bemoan the loss of a competitor, if AT&T does indeed end up buying T-Mobile, we can at least welcome a new one in the mobile data space. LightSquared just signed Best Buy up for its LTE service to power Best Buy Connect. LightSquared wants to build LTE infrastructure and sell it to others to market, thus keeping them far away from conflicts of interest. Leap Wireless also has a roaming agreement with LightSquared for Cricket Wireless users. So George Hot's case is just getting crazy now. Sony has filed a new document arguing that legal action against George Hot should proceed in California based on evidence they say confirms Geo Hot's holds a PSN account, a PlayStation Network account. That would mean that he would have had to agree to the terms of service, which means he agreed for the case to be tried in California. Mm -hmm. Sony has a New Jersey IP address associated with one of Hot's PS3s, and it's linked to an account called Blickmanic, and they've also found that username... Uh, in forums discussing jailbreaking, which George Hotz was one of the first people to jailbreak an mm -hmm. iPhone. Now, according to the console maker, Hotz also has removed components from his impounded hard drives and can't deliver the needed hardware to the courts because he's in South America. What's he doing in South America? Wearing a fake beard is my guess. <laughs> and like, you know, <laughs> hanging out in cafes. Something linen and yeah. white. It's just like, no, George, never heard of George Hotz. Don't know who he is. I think he's in South America. Well, I don't know. Oh, this this jurisdiction thing is not good for his his legal fees. I'll tell you that much. Yeah, right. It's been going on for a while. Yeah, he's just like he bounced on out of here. Uh, report out. by Bloomberg, which cites anonymous sources, says Apple's weighing a licensing program for the video component of its AirPlay technology that would let gadget makers incorporate the wireless streaming into it, uh, Apple's wireless streaming into televisions and set top boxes. Currently, only Apple's own Apple TV can take advantage of AirPlay for video. Device makers can license the audio portion of AirPlay already. But if they could also license the video portion, that would be awesome. Mm -hmm. That would actually make a lot of more sense, sense to me. Yeah. Yeah. I think this is definitely going to happen. Definitely. I think this is Apple's, Ben Apple's plan the whole time. All right. Uh, let's finish off with a stupid criminal account. 
A uh, hacker uh, and former contract security guard admitted to hacking into a hospital's computer system where he worked, uh, was sentenced to 110 months in federal prison. They found him because not only did he record himself doing the hacking, but then he made a tutorial video with the theme from Mission Impossible playing, surprised it didn't get uh, taken down for copyright violation, uh, showing himself hacking into the hospital computers and then a voiceover explaining, here's how I did it. This is what I do. It's, it's He was part of uh, a rival hacker group to Anonymous that was trying to take down them among other hacker groups. The FBI found the CD containing the OPH crack program, off crack, uh, in his house, as well as a CD containing the video, as well as the source code for the bot that he had installed in the hospital's computers. I understand that folks want to brag about something they're proud of, mm -hmm. but this is just a really stupid idea. Yeah. It's a, it's a take on the old uh, don't return to the scene of the crime. Right. Don't post the crime to YouTube. And here's what I did next. I love the voiceover part of it. He like he actually put some production value into this. <laughs> yeah, that's not he bad. He really wanted to make sure that you learned something from his we technique. Should, we should hire him to do how-to videos right. from prison. <laughs> right. All right, let's uh, take a quick break before the calendar and thank FreshBooks for their support of TNT. Uh, you, you know, you're a freelancer, Don. Do you do a lot of invoicing? Oh, yeah, lots of it. Well, you might, you might want to take a look at FreshBooks. I've just started using them myself for my invoicing. Uh, if you're a small business owner, consultor, freelancer, invoicing is no fun, and FreshBooks minimizes the pain. They make it easy to do. An online invoicing service that's been going on since 2004, they have millions of users, creates professional-looking invoices. So you just put in the data, who you're billing, you can create your client, and then once you've created them, you don't even have to put in their address or anything anymore just to say, yeah, I'm, I'm going to build this, this company. Uh, and it will populate all of that information. You tell you know what the piece was or how many hours. Uh, then your clients can download a PDF, uh, you can email them a link. Uh, you can even, for a little extra money, have an invoice printed and sent. You don't have to do anything. All you have to do is click, and they can pay you by PayPal or 11 other electronic payment services or by credit card. They even include an automated late payment reminder. So try out FreshBooks free today for up to three of your clients. So you get free three clients before you have to pay for anything. Uh, so you set up an account. It's a piece of cake. You can try it out. And when they ask you how you heard about them, say TNT. You heard it on Tech News Today because every day FreshBooks is giving away a birthday cake to one of you. And it doesn't have to be your birthday for you to get a free cake. It doesn't have to be your birthday. Uh, another good reason to go there. Right? Yes. Easy invoicing and free cake. Not a lie. Onto the calendar. <laughs> uh, the sh shareholders of HP have finally approved the director slate. So it's official. New board of directors in place at a meeting in Arlington, Virginia today. They made it official. NVIDIA's next flagship graphics card will be unveiled at 9 a.m. tomorrow. That's Thursday. Hmm. That's 6 a.m. my time. Yeah. I may just read about it after I get up. Yeah, I think that's I, it's fair. <laughs> but, I mean, yeah, I think uh, it's going to be... Think of the people in Hawaii. They've really got it hard. 3 a.m. Just don't go to bed. <laughs> it's going to be the GTX 590. That's my guess. Uh, Chumbi 8 is set to ship on April 5th for $1.99, and pre-orders opened today. There Tom, eight Chumbies? I know that you've wow. pre-ordered your playbook. Yes. Have you also pre-ordered a Chumbi 8? I have not. Dawn? Chumby Not eight? a chance. <laughs> Not a chance. I like that there's a Chumby 8. Yeah. I, I just, you know, what that's did just... Chumby it's getting eight. less and less cute. Right. <laughs> like, I no, I mean, like, it used to be all fluffy right? and, you know, pillowy It used to be like a stuff. beanie baby. Yeah, yeah. It was like a child's yeah. toy. Totally. It's like the Chucky, and it was Chumby you know, 2. Chumby Part 8. <laughs> reckoning. Uh, Wi-Fi HTC eight. Flyer tablet is coming exclusively to Best Buy in late March or early April. These dates are according to Taiwan parts manufacturers. Sprint's WiMAX version was announced yesterday called the HTC Evo View. Uh, Verizon says its LTE network will cover at least 147 U.S. cities by the end of 2011. That's a lot. Um, some cities in Hawaii, no cities in Alaska. Oh. And as far as New York goes, Ithaca in, yeah. Buffalo not. Oh, Buffalo they, passed over. I thought they were going to be in all the major football markets. Uh, no. No. Not on uh, not uh, by the end of 2011 they won't be. All right. Sorry, mm. Bills. Moving on to voicemails that we got an, a video sent to us by Dave, who is one of the many people who found a good use for the iPad cover. This is how to make use of an iPad too. Not the music. By playing Oasis. No. By <laughs> putting uh, it up. Oh, it's a Tom Merritt special. To the refrigerator. 
showing a food program. <laughs> Potentially teaching you how to make food. Yes. Right there in the how kitchen. How cool is that? <laughs> Amazing. Thanks for sending that along, Dave. We like getting videos from people. Send them along to TNT at uh, twit.tv. Just send us a link, like, uh, like you know, put it up on YouTube or something like that. Also, uh, send it along a, uh, a file of a voicemail was our dear friend Alex. Is he in Austria or is he just I Austrian? I, I can't remember. I, if I remember, it was Alex in Romania. But he's good with... No, he's not in Romania. No? I know that for sure. Oh, um, I, th I thought that's what he said. Really? Way back when. He's somewhere. I know yeah, he's, he's German. He's somewhere. And he always corrects us. Here's his latest <laughs> Here we one. go. He'll correct us again, I'm sure. Hello, TNT crew. This is Alex with a little correction. You said the Amazon App Store for Android is only available in the U.S. And that is not true because I have it and I use it. I am not from the U.S. The only thing is if you're out of the U.S., you... Don't go to your local Amazon side. You go to the U.S. side, and then it's no problem. Mm. Yeah. Ah. Later. Not so much a correction as a workaround. I like it. Yeah. Totally. Thanks for the tip, Alex. If you know to go to the U.S. Are, side, it works for now. <laughs> On to the emails, TNT at twit.tv. Steve from O'Fallon, Illinois, home of St. Clair Square Mall, says, I was excited to install and use the new Android App Store earlier today on my Epic 4G. I downloaded and installed the App Store application and entered in all of my Amazon account information from the main menu on the phone app. I clicked the games category, wanted to filter the list by user reviews, so I attempted to click the refine button, inadvertently clicked the buy app button directly under the refine button, and I had a gift card balance on my account from the holiday season. The purchase was deducted with no confirmation screen. Mm. I sent an email to Amazon, and they were good about refunding my money. Less than eight hours to respond. But I think the application interface is laid out poorly, and this could happen to other people. Amazon told me that purchases in the App Store require one click, even though I had it disabled in my web account settings. And this cannot be disabled in the app. One click can't be disabled? That's wrong, that's, Amazon. That's Come crazy. on, fix that. Uh, Steve isn't the first person to complain about this. And, you know, to everybody who complains, boy, iTunes asked for my password way too much. It does keep me from buying things by accident. That's actually exactly what it's good for. So, yeah, Amazon, right. if, if they get enough complaints, they'll... They'll change that policy. Uh, next email from Andre says, Hi, guys and girl. Hi, Andre. I'm from Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, and I'm just writing in to rant about the new Amazon Android App Store. You guys covered it in episode 204. Being U.S. only, I can't play the new Angry Birds, Rio, because, well, I live in Rio. What? Yeah. That's just wrong, I can too. order a physical, real, volume, and weight-owning object from Amazon. They'll charge my credit card. They'll put their thing in a package and, and UPS it to me. But I can't order or download for free a virtual bite-only five-second downloadable app from the App Store. Nonsense. Yeah, it sucks. That is total nonsense. Yeah. There yeah. should be a law. There should. If, you, if, the, if an Angry Birds comes out with your location on it, <laughs> you get it. Your grandfather did. You have yeah. to be able to buy it. <laughs> or they should change the name. Yes, or they, yeah, they should change the name to Angry Birds Moon because nobody lives on <laughs> yeah, the moon. Exactly. Could it be like Angry Birds Rio Grande? <laughs> <laughs> yes. That's not a Doesn't apply to you, Andre. Yeah. It's Texas. I'm just kidding. All right. It's very clearly Rio de Janeiro because they have a movie coming out as well. Don Reisinger, uh, thanks so much for being on the show. Good to have you. Let folks know about yeah, Digital Home here. and where they can find all the stuff you do online. Yeah, they can go. There. I mean, I put all my stuff on uh, Twitter at Don Reisinger's Don R E I Singer, so you can find all the stuff I do there. And thanks to everybody for watching us. You can find us on the web at twit.tv slash TNT. Give us a call. 260-TNT-SHOW is our Google voice number. Or you can leave us an email. TNT at twit.tv is the email address. We'll see you tomorrow.